Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt from Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, here for the final day, day four of ESC 2020. And we're going to do a wrap up of the trials from today and maybe a little bit about the whole meeting. I'm joined by two good friends, Dr. Kim Eagle, our fearless leader of ACC.org from the University of Michigan, and Dr. Gabriel Stegg from Hopital Bichat and the University of Paris. So maybe Gabriel, we can start with you uh, with a trial that both of us were involved with leading the Themis trial where Dr. Mark Banaka presented Themis PAD. Do you wanna tell the audience exactly what that was? Well, uh, Themis was a trial that looked at Ticagalor versus placebo on top of aspirin in patients with diabetes and stable coronary artery disease in patients who had never had either a prior stroke nor a prior MI. And um, the, the trial found overall a significant benefit of Ticagalor with a an increased risk of bleeding. The net clinical benefit was actually greater in the large uh, two thirds of the population who had a prior history of PCI. And these are the patients in whom really there seems to be a lot of the action. Now the theme is PAD analysis looked at a different subset of the population. It looked at patients with PAD and stable coronary artery disease. And we've known for many years from previous trials that this is a subgroup that has a very high risk. And that is indeed confirmed in the Themis PAD uh, analysis. PAD patients with coronary artery disease are much higher risk than patients with coronary artery disease and without PAD. The interesting part is the Ticagalor analysis where the benefit uh, was there. It was actually substantial in that population because they're higher risk, but also the benefit on the peripheral and limb events was there. There was actually benefit of Ticagalo in reducing acute limb ischemia and peripheral revascularizations and amputations. And the, the magnitude of the benefit was actually uh, quite large in relative terms. Even though these are relatively rare events, they're catastrophic events for patients. So I think it's, it's really interesting to see that this very high risk population derives a substantial benefit from more intensive anti-thrombotic intervention in this instance dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagalor compared to aspirin alone. And because this is an underserved high-risk population, I think this is really important. Yeah, that's a great summary. I, I don't have anything to add, but I'll mention to the audience that in June in the United States, ticagalor was FDA approved for essentially a Themis-like indication, that is for patients with coronary artery disease without prior MI, uh, or prior stroke. And in fact, the, the label expansion wasn't even restricted just to diabetes, though the Themis trial was all diabetes. And I think the FDA appropriately focused on high risk CAD, realizing diabetes is one thing that demarcates high risk, but that in a physician's opinion, there might be other things. So that uh, was a, I think, interesting and important development. And just a few days ago, Health Canada also approved Ticagalor based on Themis PCI for a bit more of a narrow uh, indication patients with diabetes and prior PCI. So uh, now a new option for patients. And I think the Themis PAD data helps us uh, further not only understand Ticagalor, but understand PAD and the huge unmet needs uh, in those sorts of patients. Well, Kim, let me turn things over to you about brace corona. This is an important study having to do with ACE and ARB and COVID. There's been a lot of noise and controversy on this topic. Uh, can you tell the audience what the study was and found? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting study that, of course, we've been wrestling with the fact that the, the COVID-19 virus has something to do with the uh, ACE receptors in the lungs in terms of entry into the lungs. And so there's been all kinds of speculation that either ACEs and ARBs protect or potentially they're detrimental to either getting it or uh, suffering from the consequences of COVID-19. This is a study which asked the question, um, is there any difference if you stop ACE ARB uh, in the early days after admission for COVID-19 pneumonia? The notion being that uh, potentially if the virus has uh, greater or lesser access, depending on whether you're on these agents, the, the level of pneumonia disability might be different. Um, and it was a large trial, about 650 patients that were randomized to either stay on their drug or go off their drug. All the patients had hypertension, half of them were obese. Um, and there was no effect on 30-day mortality. It was about 2.7, 2.8% in both groups. So there did not appear to be a signal uh, from the point of view of the lung effects of COVID-19 of uh, this particular class of drugs. And, and so I think the right answer would be if the patient uh, continues to have blood pressure that justifies 
ACE ARB and they're already on it, it's perfectly fine to continue. Obviously, if they're sick and they have a lower blood pressure, we should be tapering off antihypertensives and it's perfectly safe also to taper them off these drugs if necessary. Yeah, it's a great summary. I think there's a, a word of humility here for physicians because, you know, there's the ACE2 receptor. That's how you know, viral entry can occur. And I think, you know, physicians, most of whom aren't really trained as basic scientists, sort of saw that and some thought ACE are, you know, that there's going to be some bad interaction here. And then there were all sorts of reports of patients prematurely discontinuing ACE and ARB. And there was all sorts of observational data inherently confounded. So I really credit these investigators for doing a randomized trial. And I think putting this issue to bed, if the patient has an indication for an ACE and ARB, just you know, go ahead and use it. Obviously, if they're sick and hypotensive, well, then you probably shouldn't be using any blood pressure lowering medicine while they're acutely ill. Uh, Gabriel, what are your thoughts? I mean, you're involved with overseeing a lot of COVID research in France. What do you think about this call? Yeah, well, I think it's really important because that's a question that comes up all the time. And unfortunately, this is not over as we all know. So we're, we're still left in a quandary about what to do. There's been concern initially, then reassurance from more uh, observational studies and basic studies. But I think having clinical data from randomized trials is really the best. There, there are other ongoing efforts. It's similar types of trial in, in Europe and in France, but I, I was really impressed with the results of this one. I think they're already pretty clear. Yeah, I no, totally agree. So maybe for our last trial, we'll cover what I think is a really important topic, a fascinating trial called Reality, presented by none other than Professor Gabriel Stegg. So maybe Gabriel, you can give us a recap. Yeah, so this is a trial addressing what is the optimal strategy for transfusion in patients with acute myocardial infarction and anemia. This is fairly common. We don't really know what to do. We suspect that transfusion may be either harmful or beneficial, and there have been many observational studies that have yielded conflicting results, and there's no good randomized data. There have, there have been only two very small randomized studies, 45 patients, one, 110 patients the other, that actually give conflicting results. And so uh, six years ago, we embarked on a, a randomized trial, uh, enrolling these patients with hemoglobin uh, between seven and 10 grams, an acute MI, type one, and uh, assigning them to either transfusing with a liberal transfusion strategy as soon as hemoglobin was below 10, or a restrictive transfusion strategy where you waited until it reached eight or less to transfuse. And the trial was designed to test non-inferiority of the restrictive strategy, we suspected we might reach non-inferiority, but then there are other important factors with transfusion. It's a costly treatment and blood is a scarce resource. So we also designed the trial for cost effectiveness. Actually, the primary outcome of the trial is cost effectiveness, but it's of course, to establish cost effectiveness, you need to have efficacy. And efficacy is determined by MACE at 30 days. And what we found, uh, to make a long story short, after randomizing six and 668 patients in France and Spain in a publicly funded trial, was indeed we reached non-inferiority with actually a numerical trend in favor of the restrictive strategy with fewer MACE at 30 days. And in terms of cost effectiveness, this, the restrictive strategy is highly cost effective with uh, actually a negative ICER and a dominant cost effectiveness result the restrictive strategy is dominant. In addition to this, the restrictive strategy was slightly safer with fewer bacteriemias or bacterial infections, fewer ARDSs, and it saved, it spared more than 55% of the transfused blood. So when you put all of this together, you have quite a compelling picture to favor a restrictive transfusion strategy. So we're hoping that this might change clinical practice. I will point out that there's a similar design trial a larger one, albeit that's ongoing worldwide, but sponsored by the NIH called MINT, that is testing superiority of the restrictive strategy. So I think uh, this is a, an interesting and important space for which we've been lacking randomized data for many years, and it's starting to come now. Yeah, congratulations on a great trial, practice changing for sure. I should mention I'm on the Data Safety Monitoring Board of that NIH trial you mentioned, Mint. I have a question for you, Gabriel. Uh, what do you think the implications are just in terms of whether the restrictive folks need to get transfused? That is, hemoglobin is, say, 7.5. Uh, does that person need to get transfused, or can we be even more restrictive? 
I think that's the next question. I think that we, we can't really answer this uh, with the data we have, because we, fortunately we don't have that many patients who are that low. Uh, we see that the results appear to be quite consistent over a broad spectrum of hemoglobin values. Uh, and in patients who are below eight, the restrictive strategy was also superior. In fact, in that subgroup, there's even a statistically significant benefit of the restrictive strategy. So maybe even being even more stricter might be beneficial. Kim, what do you think? You take care of a lot of surgical patients. Uh, well, I, yeah, this is, um, it, I wanna congratulate Gabrielle and the, and the investigators for doing a key trial. It reminds me a little bit of the coronary bypass graft literature years ago where you may recall, uh, we would routinely transfuse patients who dropped their hematocrits. Uh, and then finally randomized trials were done and, and in patients who've been revascularized uh, it was perfectly safe to allow the hemoglobin to drop below eight, even seven, even potentially six. Uh, so if if this strategy saves half the transfusions, that's magnificent. Uh, there can be more done, of course, for further trials, patients who are lower. We should point out that these patients had been revascularized, correct, Gabrielle? They had their MI treated uh, so that the, you know, the, the culprit lesion had been dealt with. But with that caveat, I just I think this changes our practice for sure, or solidifies what we thought based on the cardiac surgical literature before us. Well, actually, not all of them had been revascularized. They could be enrolled at any time after their admission for acute MI if they had anemia. So some of them had not yet been revascularized, and they could still have acute myocardial ischemia. And this is one of the reasons why we did not we could not rely on the pre-existing evidence from other settings such as cardiac surgery or ICU or GI bleeding, uh, looking at transfusion to decide what transfusion strategy is best because in patients who have ongoing or recent acute myocardial ischemia, the results might actually be very different. Yeah, so well, that's a, a, a real leap forward in our understanding due to that aspect of the trial. Well, it's been a great discussion uh, with you both. Thank you, uh, Kim. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, thank you, audience. This is our day four wrap-up. Hopefully you've enjoyed our coverage of all four days. If you missed any coverage before, it's all on acc.org, along with clinical trial summaries, journal scans, news reports. So really everything that was worth covering at ESC 2020, we will have posted there in real time, essentially, for you to view at your leisure now a week from now, a month from now, whatever you might want. And, and hopefully you find it a, a useful resource. Thank you for watching. And uh, for those of you that have been holding down the fort while we've been doing all this coverage, thank you for your service to patients.